Good morning, and welcome to Gilead Lutheran Church. First of all, thank you for being with us, Pastor Han. Good to see you again. Thursday, we are having the dinner, and it is Parmesan chicken, not chicken parm. There's a difference. Mashed potatoes, great and desserts, question mark. I don't know what I was told we were going to have. She didn't tell me. Um, sure, it was Ford, I just lost it. Last week, we took the bottles in before we had our little trip. So we have another $24 in bottles. Plus, there's probably close to that at my house to take down again. So, basically, since we started this program, we have picked up $500. And we keep using that. Say we're going to use it for the Thanksgiving baskets. Are there any other announcements? Enjoy your worship.
church of God and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord.
mercy, and impartiality toward others. The second reading is from the third chapter of James. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspirational, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there also will be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they do come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly and want to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Here ends the reading. Chance 
in a capricious universe? As the villain says in that movie, it would be fitting if I were apprehended and punished. At least there would be some small side of justice, some small measure of hope for the possibility of meaning. But he isn't. I mean, is this what God has created? Is this what God sustains? Then why pray? So the disciples fell into silence for a short while. Then they began buzzing all the way to Capernaum out of Jesus' earshot. So when he, Jesus asked them, they would not let them fall into silence again. They don't want no Jesus to know that they were arguing about who was the greatest. If that kind of argument can be expected in the wake of puzzling over what kind of God God is. As the existentialists say, if nothing means anything, then you've got to make your own meaning. Ernest Beck, the author of The Denial of Death, describes life as a quest to, to uh, defeat the annihilation people fear death to be. People engage in efforts to build some kind of immortality, something that can create meaning or continue to create meaning beyond one's own life. Who is the greatest among them? Why should they care? They care because the great will be remembered. Mary Doria Russell's novel, Dreamers of the Day, ends with a vision of the afterlife, where souls continue to exist just as long as someone remembers them. When they are finally forgotten, when the last friend or family member dies, poof, they're gone. Socrates, Napoleon, they get to be remembered, so they keep on uh, keeping on. But most people don't. Likewise, in a world where some think we're all dust in the wind, the wind blows when and where it blows unpredictably, they don't feel safe. And when we don't feel safe, we create our own safety. Who is the greatest? Who's untouchable? Who is unforgettable? Can we relate to that? You know, speaking of the greatest, I uh, always felt that Muhammad Ali, especially when he was known as Cassius Clay, was honest. Now, everybody in my high school thought he was a disgrace to sportsmanship and all his bragging. <clears throat> I am the greatest. His bragging came to a crescendo one minute after he won the championship. He said, I want everyone to bear witness. I am the greatest. I am the greatest thing that ever lived. I don't have a mark on my face, and I upset Sonny Liston, and I just turned 22 years old. I must be the greatest. I showed the world. I talked to God every day. I shook up the world, and I'm king of the world. You must listen to me. I am the greatest. I can't be me. I remember our English teacher proudly announcing how poorly Ali had done the U.S. Armed Forces qualified test, as if that proved something. Sportsmen don't go around yelling, I am the greatest. Maybe is he too stupid to realize this? One should have had the humility of a Floyd Patterson, or at least Sonny Liston. A few of us, though, got the joke, or at least what I always thought what Muhammad Ali's joke was. I mean, this is the man who also said, I'm not conceited, I'm just convinced. I'm so modest, I commit my own faults. My only fault is I don't realize how great I really am. <laughs> and he also said, I'm so fast that last night I turned off the lights to my hotel room and I was in bed before the room went dark. And I'll beat him so bad he'll need a shoehorn for his hat. Years later, he let everyone in on the joke when he said, I am America. I am the part you won't recognize, but get used to me. Black, confident, cocky, my name, not yours. My religion, not yours. My goals, my own, get used to. He grabbed the American dream just like anyone he'd seen achieve it. And he wrote a commentary on the inner life of ambition as he did so. As he also said, at home I am a nice guy, but I don't want the world to know. Humble people I found don't get very far. Humble on the inside, arrogant on the outside. Muhammad Ali flipped the cultural imagery of all American greatness on its head, which is to be humble on the outside and secretly arrogant on the inside. That, I think, was his joke. 
I think most people never get the joke. I mean, can you imagine a politician running for national office not saying this is the greatest nation ever, ever to exist on the face of the earth, <coughs> or some other variation of we are the greatest? I can't. At least I can't recall any national politician saying, eh, it's a pretty good country. It'll do. Thus, the disciples argue, who is the greatest? Humble on the outside, arrogant on the inside. These disciples may have their fears, but they also have a sense of shame. They don't tell Jesus about their argument, but Jesus has figured them out. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Let's hold that for a moment. Jesus and a little child. Jesus and little children. I mean, what do you see in your mind's eye? I don't know about you, but the images I struggle to get out of my mind are those paintings of Jesus and the adorable little children. They're sentimental. And sentimentality entirely, entirely messes up what Jesus is saying. Oh, come on, Pastor. We like children to be cute. There are so many cute stories. A little child goes to the for the first time and watches the ushers pass out the offering plates. When they near the pew where he sat, he piped up so that everyone could hear. Don't pay for me, Daddy. I'm under five. A little girl became restless as the preacher's servant went on and on. Finally, she leaned over to her mother and whispered, Mommy, if we give them the money now, will he let us go? <laughs> This would actually happen to me. I was presenting a children's sermon during Advent, talking about how the angel visited Mary and told her she was going to have a baby, Jesus, and how when the angel appeared, she was afraid, and I asked the children, and why was Mary afraid? Without missing a beat, the seven-year-old replied, because she didn't have a husband? On the other hand, People would not have dared to expect so much of children in ancient times. Being a child was in many ways a terrifying typo. Infant mortality rates sometimes reached 30%. Another 30% of live births were dead by age 6, and 60% had died by age 16. Children only suffered first from famine, war, disease, and dislocation. In some areas or eras, few would have lived to adulthood with both parents alive. The orphan was a stereotype of the weakest and most vulnerable members of society. So Jesus holds the most vulnerable of human beings and identifies with this person. He holds a human being who has only a 40% chance of making it through the teen years. He says to his disciples that they should consider themselves followers of a child. What kind of God is this? What kind of God identifies with the weakest of the weak? What kind of God indeed but a God who humbles God's self by becoming one with humanity in the first place? To God we are all as vulnerable as this little child with a 40% chance of the sweet 16 party. And if we can't get that, we are only making the world a little more miserable. It is so far as we are here, precious, how precious we are, how much to be valued in this every being. Let us take note. Jesus identifies with the most vulnerable and predicts his cross. In so doing, he raises a mirror to us all. He shows it our, our self interests for what they are illusions, all too often tragic illusions. If I am the greatest, somebody else is the most worthless. If I am a winner, somebody else is a loser. In a deep sense, this to me is what the cross of Christ is all about. This is what atonement is all about. To contemplate the crucified God, as Yuri Lopeland put it, to contemplate the crucified God is to recognize the Lord there, but also to recognize he knew that all along. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. To contemplate the crucified God is to contemplate how he does not let his followers continue with their gross spiritual problems, but keeps teaching, keeps reaching. In a sense, the cross of Christ is like an icon. 
You know, praying with icons is important to Eastern Christianity. And here's a brief introduction, courtesy of the upper room. Praying with icons is an ancient prayer practice that involves keeping our eyes wide open, taking into our heart what the image visually communicates. We focus not on what is seen in the icon, but rather on what is seen through it. The love of God expressed through God's creatures. When we contemplate what Christ's cross really means, when the love of God breaks through our games and illusions, that's atonement. Yet we've known that all along, haven't we? We sing it often, particularly in Lent. Christians have sung these words of Isaac Watts for several hundred years. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count the loss, and pour content on all my pride. Amen.
heal divisions in our country and local communities, that together we might cooperate for the good of all. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is greater. Faithful God, you draw near to you all who are in need. Bring healing and wholeness to all who suffer. Transform economic, political, and social systems that oppress vulnerable people, especially systems of structural racism and generational poverty. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Transforming God, you accompany all changes and transitions. Help us to see where you are calling this community to new ways of living with gospel promise. Assure us that even as change brings loss, it also brings hope and life. Merciful God, you embrace us on our final pilgrimage for life. Accompany all who have died, console those who mourn, and at the last, show us the way to eternal life in you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is We entrust these and all our prayers to you, holy God, in the name of your beloved Jesus Christ, our Savior.
remembrance of me. Yet I am suffering, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all his prayers, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for all people and for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever.